I tried speeding up the film and exporting it, but it wouldn't let me, and so I'll just just treat this one as a little brief podcast. There's not going to be an interesting visual for this video. Okay, so I feel like I have a lot to say about this one. Firstly, it's definitely worth mentioning, I saw these two films, the first two of these, these Bourne films, at a fairly formative and impressionable age. I was... I would have been 11 years old, and yeah, I watched them. They're, they're two of the earlier grown up movies I watched, you know. I mean, grown up, that's kind of relative, but you know, very serious. You know, you didn't understand what the heck all these people were talking about in these computer rooms, but there was just such a seriousness to it all that was just absolutely captivating. I have a great rush of feeling when I watch this film again, and, and the next one as well, in particular, and it's possibly going to cloud um, how I feel about these films now. Like, I'm going to be describing certain things about this film which some people may think, some older viewers who saw this film when they were like, you know, over the age of 40 might think, oh, it's so, so what? But uh, hear me out. This was such great escapism and this set a great tone for the kind of tense blockbusters of the of the century so, so thus far. I think we get a precedent for that. Um, the, the, the score utilised in these films, that kind of... Um, that tense, you know, um, string section going in and out. That seems to set a precedent for that Hans Zimmer Dark Knight thing, which was copied relentlessly afterward. In general, what what the these first two films demonstrate, um, these are the ones that are most prominent in my mind. Uh, do you remember in the that the the cinematographic philosophy of the quick cuts? This was the domain of. EDM music videos in the nineteen nineties. You know, it was meant to s simulate the or stimulate the altered states of psychotropic drugs say however by the 21st century it became a fantastic medium in order to demonstrate the the new information age how the and it, you know there was similarities to be had with the, the prospect of your mind going you know a mile a minute on a in a certain state versus you know a tripping versus you know um constantly you know data to data information to information you know going from tab to tab in the context of a computer filing through information in the 21st century. It makes sense to me how these, as this one aesthetic from one decade evolved into a norm in a mainstream kind of a style within the next. And now onto the scenario of the film itself. It was fantastic escapism. Just the idea that this normal man didn't know who he was, was had was trying to figure out the, the backstory, how, how, how he got to here, why he was in the, the oceans near, near France and and how why you know wake wakes up and you know he's got it's such an interesting you know this what's this this laser pointer with a Swiss bank account what what is that and then the that feeling of is this you know it's 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 eleven year old's first exposure to that like Franz Kafka the trial esque tone of narrative it's a phenomenal piece of persecution complex fiction if if you want to be engaged with that sort of narrative and being taken on a ride of you know you don't know. You know who to trust is that like, this is great on the run, uh, you know kind of f f scenario. That there's also the without having the kind of burden of a backstory where you you know you've it's just unrealistic and you know you're you couldn't relate to it. You know with the blank slate that was the, that these Jason Bourne at the start of this film. It's 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 excellent to have that that vessel for um, to project you can be the normal guy and you can imagine oh what would I do how would I escape this this embassy it's it's excellent it's an excellent vehicle for this Doug Lehman's directorial style is incredibly impressive for a filmmaker who had only worked on independent films the handling of the action sequences in this film is excellent those red complaints about Paul Greengrass's style I wonder if they would have as much to dis disdain for the work here there's only four major action sequences in this film one is the there's the fight sequence in the apartment with the pen versus the knife. That's really, really cool. Then there's that classic uh, chase through Paris, which is excellently done. Apparently the second unit director handled that. Lehman was not responsible for that, which just makes sense. Because I was, I was going to say, like, if Lehman was responsible for that, I'd be like, dude, you're a god to go from fucking, what, like, what do you direct? Like, swings or something? To, like, to this? Like, that's insane. Anyway, then you have to, to influence the direction of 21st century action films. Anyway... And then, of course, there's the there's that brief sniper sequence near the house with and the, with Clive Owen's character, that assassin. Look at us! What look at what they make you give? And then finally, there's this fairly modest but well thought out and incredibly exciting. It's that 
that little shootout sequence of the three the three hitmen as he's going down the stairwell. That's that's awesome. That's it's really because it doesn't. It's amazing how like all it's how 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 refreshing a, a film builds up to just him trying to get to the bottom of the building and there's three people in his way with guns. And, and it's it's as exciting as as you know all this John Wick madness, and I don't dislike John Wick. It's, I'm just I'm just saying, or Mad Max Fury Road. Like this sequence in the Bourne Identity is as exciting as anything in that have come, has come out in film since then. That's interesting to me. This, the film still feels very contemporary, but given it's from two thousand and two, extremely modest, graceful, and tasteful. And here's where Doug Lehman's direction was most useful. Fundamentally, this is a film about Jason Bourne getting to know the character of Marie, portrayed by Run Lola Run. She's a very, very beautiful woman and an excellent actress. This is, I love how the core of this film is the relationship between these two characters and um, the kind of existential burden that these two are feeling by the time they get to the the Eamon's house. Oh man, the, the, the atmosphere, it just drips mood. This film is so it's so rich. You could it's the the emotional atmosphere of this film. It it there's it there's this there's a mist that pervades everything, which is it's it's so involving. And then by the end, when he's asked to you know he's you know go run off, and then he's going to confront Conklin by himself, and it builds up to that sequence where he's there's the three guys and he's trying to get to the bottom of the building. Honestly, it's very effective cinema in my opinion. I think it holds up extremely well. Maybe because it was so formative on me, I I see it, but maybe if I'd seen it for the first time now, it wouldn't make as much of an impression on me, but man, I'm really glad it does. I love the idea that there are those who saw the film, as I said, over the age of like, say, 35 or 40, back when it came out, and they're thinking, man, this is like, you what? They're, they're, thinking, they're hearing my perspective on this, and they're just kind of shaking their heads thinking, it's a good film, but you just saw it too young, kid. But like, <laughs> yeah, maybe. I, I, this is, it's so interesting. I, I love what it speaks about um, one's perspective and um, what one's formative years have on their... Um, how, how it affects the rest of their life, the majority of their life. I have to be honest, I like this film so much to the point where in, yeah, I kind of wish this was the only one. I think we'd all appreciate this film a lot more if it was the only one, if it didn't fall into the detested Paul Greengrass aesthetic of the next two. And then there was that silly one of Jeremy Renner, which like wasn't even Matt Damon. And then there was the another one which came out with Paul Greengrass, which people didn't like at all. And they, 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 if, I, I started watching it once, and I didn't care for it personally. It seemed too serious. It's like we need to get Jason Bourne. It's Jason Bourne. It's just like it's not about anything anymore. I would argue this is slightly controversial. Ultimatum is not about anything. Ultimatum is far and away the weakest of this trilogy, although it has some interesting. If you like the Paul Greengrass stuff, it's kind of cool, I guess. But narratively like ethereally it's far and away the least captivating of the three i saw it a bit later though so maybe that has something to do with it it was the first i was aware of i was i remember seeing the born ultimatum came out in cinemas in 2007 that's yeah so the year i saw the neck the first two but um initially i was just aware of the born ultimatum coming out it seemed like a big movie very serious movie very interesting film people were calling it one of the greatest things they'd ever seen I remember seeing that poster around and I remember it was around the time with that um if you're in Australia that song um Straight Lines by Silverchair was playing all of the time. Two thousand seven. Also, um um what's that song? Um, Pictures by Sneaky Sound System. Um anyway, but moving on. Then the film came out on DVD and everyone was renting it, everyone was loving it. I remember like some of my uh, older relatives or some older cousins of mine were raving about it. Um and then I remember eventually got to the point oh, I think my dad was talking about like oh yeah The Born Identity those are great movies I read the books back in the 80s and I was like oh yeah so I remember renting yeah The Born Identity and The Born Supremacy and I remember it was yeah I mean, we've got a, a, new, a new cat around the same time so it was just a very vivid period of my life and then we'd moved into a new house not that kind of months before and so everything just coincided you know coincided to be one of the more memorable film viewing experiences of my, you know, uh, primary school years, which is The Born Identity, that rented DVD in 2007. I remember The Born Supremacy. And then, so, for, for a while there, before The Born Legacy came out, there was a brief period there where the Jason Bourne trilogy was considered one of the great bastions of cinema in the 2000s. People loved to talk about it. It was considered a great film trilogy, like this original Star Wars or Lord of the Rings or... Uh, Sage at Ray, okay, well, it's a bit extreme, but you know, 
Star Wars trilogy, whatever you want to name. People are like, oh, the Jason Bourne trilogy. This is genius. It's a great action trilogy of all time. And then the reputation kind of faded away. I don't know if there was the two subsequent movies, four and five, that came out, or if people were just getting sick. But the people were really tired of the Paul Greengrass style being replicated. And even rewatching those films, I think people grew quite, quite weary of, of those scenes. Although, go back to this one. None of it's here. It's plausibly the best film of the trilogy. Easily. Of the whole series. I was just thinking of the trilogy. And so there was a time when these films were adulated, and now they're just considered, I don't know, fine or even trashy to a point. I. There's a few more um, thoughts I'd, I'd share on this trilogy and the aesthetics in general, which are more relevant to a discussion of supremacy, so I might save it for that video in particular. I'd like to discuss, too, the interesting uh, alternate ending that this film had. There's an extremely fascinating. Well, when I watched a DVD of this film at one point, when I rewatched this film at one point um, from a DVD which was my own, I didn't, not a rented copy, around 2010, I guess I got the trilogy on the little box set, and I remember watching Identity again in, you know, I was, would have been 14 or so, and there was a little intro at the start of the film where the filmmakers are talking about how the original ending featured this shootout at a petrol station, which did, you know, ended in like an explosion and they all thought it was very cool. Um, I, I, I don't have a DVD on me right now. It's at my parents' place, I believe. And so I, I can't, you know, go back and check because I, I, I looked up on YouTube. I couldn't find any footage of a, of a shootout sequence of a petrol station that ends in an explosion. Although I was able to find, and there was clips of this in that little sequence, part of the original ending featured, yeah, so Jason Bourne would collapse while he was after some sequence and he was looking for for Marie and he wakes up in a strange hotel room and then there's Brian Cox's character and he gives one of those great you know 21st century 2000s like Brian Cox speeches you know so it doesn't have to be fair Jason still have choice it's between you and me but after all it's only one thing we can do you know you, only you have the options Jason for, for, for. But what matters now? Only you have the keys. Decide what happens next. It's up to you. But of course. We all know who makes that decision. It's just, just some silliness. <laughs> it's good stuff though. I, I love, love Brian Cox around this time. You know, um, Striker and X-Men 2. And like, you know, um, the, the, he's, he's that character in these films. This is such a fun and like watchable presence. And we got you got to love him as Manhunt. There's, um... Animal, Animal Lecter and the Manhunter. That's amazing. That's one of the great films of all time. I'm a, I'm one of those Manhunter people, by the way. I think I've established that before. Anyway, we've gotten to the point where I think The Born Identity may be an unsung film. Think of it as a sole feature. Forget about the sequels and anything that they brought to the world of filmmaking, which can be your, or is often disdained. I think this is an absolutely quality film. Maybe it's, maybe, maybe it's just the impression I had on me at a certain time in my life. But I, I stand by that this is a really great, powerful, existential film about two people who come together in unusual circumstances and then a character who decides that he needs to, you know, find the courage and the determination to, you know, summon the things that he doesn't like about his old backstory in order to, to survive and get to a place where he can potentially enjoy his new life and, um... It's, it's, you know, it's, it's horrifying that he's had the life story that he has had, although maybe it was all worthwhile if he gets to spend the rest of it with Run, Lola, Run. I'm quite fond of this film. I, I possibly always will be. I was surprised how much I did enjoy it on this latest rewatch. There'll be subsequent videos discussing supremacy and ultimatum. We'll talk about how those held up and my further thoughts on this trilogy in general. Um, unique and interesting novelty of the 21st century cinema thus far. Once titans of the discourse, now kind of forgotten relics of the 2000s and uh, priorities in cinema we don't really care about anymore. Some people might think the the prospect of, you know, contrarian uh, defences of Michael Bay's films is kind of more appealing now, but I think these works are quite interesting in a way. But tune in next time if you're interested to hear some discussion on the Bourne Supremacy. That may not be the very next video uploaded, but it ought to be around here in the next few days or so. Thanks again, my friends. Have the best possible day night you have ever possibly imagined.